Greg, I am so happy that you came on. I just told you a second ago before we officially started that just the way you say hello <laughs> has so much resonance. There's so much consciousness in your vibration. Uh, I felt it immediately. So I'm so glad to, to have you here. I've, I've been reading your book. You have such incredible things to share. And um, I'm not surprised at all that some of the greatest performers of our time have cracked into their genius with you being the wind in their well, sails. Thank I you for coming. I just want to thank you for the opportunity uh, in reviewing uh, and just trying to study a little bit about Kathy Heller. I was overwhelmed by uh, how spiritually grounded you are, how committed you are to uh, understanding a simple formula of love isn't love until you give it away. Yeah. That's right. You're going to make me cry. Um, yeah, absolutely true. I feel that uh, we need God and spirituality always, but now more than ever, um, we need a connection to that which is eternal, because that really is who our, it, it, that's where the seed of our actual identity really is. And we talk about that a lot on this show. And it's so beautiful to hear that from so many different voices that come to that same great great infinite truth uh in slightly different ways but it all leads to the same goodness so i'm so glad that you're here your your book is coming out so soon it's called stay sane in an insane world how to control the controllables and thrive and before we even get into the book i just want to talk about you and where you where this began for you like where was greg when the fork in the road showed up and you chose to do this work, and you chose this mission. How did you choose this assignment? Um, I Again, God has a sense of humor, and I had all these plans, and he was amused by them, or she was amused by them, or they were <laughs> amused by them, <laughs> right? And um, I had this plan, I was radio, television, and film, of course. And then um, I got sidetracked by um, taking a summer job working in um alcohol and drug addiction uh at a in a state where people would go and visit and they had burned their bridges with everyone else and i was just gonna work there for the summer and have a little fun and and try to be meaningful and effective and needless to say i i didn't anticipate that it would segue into a master's in social work who wants to be a social worker? Not me. My mentor, however, was Howard Brabson. And Howard uh, Brabson saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. He believed in me before I believed in myself. He convinced me that I didn't know anything about social work. <laughs> and that um, he described that you could actually create the programs. You could actually create vehicles by which people can change their lives you can become a change agent a, a change agent i mean like 007 no that's not exactly <laughs> what we're talking about but um it was in the um it was an interesting time in my life and i had made a commitment years ago that if i had lived to see 25 there must be some purpose so the first purpose, you'll love this. The first purpose I came up with was pursue your purpose. <laughs> I mean, because you you say, well, I 20, I'm 25 now. And I've got to have purpose. Well, what's my purpose? My first purpose was to find it. And I committed wholeheartedly to pursue my purpose. I had two books that I, I, that I would engage and somebody gave me a, a this tiny little version of a New Testament ah, religion. Ah. And then Matthew, Mark, Luke, <laughs> Luke and John, just like I said, oh, this is deep. And then I had another book called Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankel. Well, <laughs> that book was so amazing that I would carry it around with me, like it was a, another type of Bible, right? And uh, I would study these two books and 
it became clear to me I needed to surrender. Oh, no, not surrender. Surrender the ego. No, not surrender the ego. The ego has helped me survive. And then the issue becomes, but how do you thrive? I was great at surviving. And then I had to learn how to thrive. And this work opens up doors where you have to transform yourself in order to work with people from a wide range of backgrounds with a lot of different types of problems and people you would never even talk to are all of a sudden in your office. And you've got to talk to them and you've got to care about them. You've got to leave with care, compassion, and concern with somebody who you wouldn't even talk to if you ever saw them anywhere else. And so in order to do that, you have to surrender the ego. Wow. That's every single word, what you said and how you said it. It's like medicine. It's <laughs> medicine. I just uh, this week interviewed an amazing woman. Her name is Dr. Lisa Miller, and she studies the, the science behind having faith. She works at Columbia University, and she really? looks at the brain when a person connects to their higher power. And I would love to put you guys in touch, but um, you and her are saying the same thing that she was saying how so often in our life, we are trying to control all the evidence and the circumstances so that we can get our way to whatever that big high in the sky dream is. And then so often you look back at your life and you go, you know, that didn't happen. You know what happened? I made this hairpin turn and I was led to something so different that I had not think I wanted. No, no. And no. there it was. It was exactly what I really, truly wanted on a soul level. And I meet a lot of people. We've done almost 800 episodes of this podcast. And so many people have come on this show from authors and celebrities and musicians. I can tell from just being with you for a few moments that you have all the things that we come to this world for. Because we don't come for a pile of stuff. No. We, we come to feel that feeling of wholeness and richness in our being and your being is tapped in and turned on and then you went ahead from some of the coolest people I've ever met are people who are in, in the sober process but you went from that to working with some of the most phenomenal athletes and they're not it's not enough to call them athletes I mean these people are able to tap into a level of hero inside themselves that other people, they know on some level. We love Michael Jordan and Tom Brady because on some level, we know that we have that inside of us. Yes, yes, well so said. Not, well, right? Yeah. It's not just about the sport. It's about the sport of how do you play this game called living into your potential. So as we sort of now are segueing into the book, I'm starting with these people that you started to work with how did that begin? Who was the first person that you worked with and you started to realize that what you had to say gave them an edge over just getting their workout in? Like, what was it that you realized they needed that you had? Well, it, it's, I'm fascinated uh, in, in contemporary right now with this book, it's it's gotten me out of the shadows because I'm a shadow warrior and you know I want to do all these things and help people. I mean, make millionaires. That's fun. But what it, it turns out to be is like it I'm amazed at how many people I've worked with. I had never really thought about it that way because remember, we're talking about sometimes 18, 19 year old children who look like adults, <laughs> who are just trying to find themselves. So I'm not working with Tom Brady. I'm working with Tom Brady. <laughs> I'm not working with Michael, Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps comes to the University of Michigan campus because we hired his coach. His coach is Bob Bowman, one of the most amazing human beings you'll ever meet. And Bob Bowman was a coachable coach, which was oxymoron but you know and he was hungry and eager and so we're working together because i'm the sports administrator for swimming and diving and uh all of a sudden a volunteer assistant coach is michael phelps duh 
And so, but I'm treating Michael Phelps like he's a 19 year old, an 18 year old. And we're not impressed that you're Michael Phelps. We got a million stars around here. Come on, let's have some fun and chat about who you are and who you're trying to become. Boom. Tom Brady. I saw what you and Desmond Howard did. <laughs> so I'm curious as to whether or not we can work together. Sure. Come on, have a seat. He's not a megastar. He's a guy struggling to find his way. He's a guy that's like hungry, but humble enough to ask for help, to be coachable. Desmond Howard, his mom and dad had programmed him to be able to identify uh, with authority figures, to respect authority figures. And he was the most coachable kid I'd ever met in my entire life. He walks in and says, tell me what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> You've seen a lot of this. Tell me what to do and what not to do. What? <laughs> he said, look, I'm not like the rest of these, these guys. If you say, don't touch it, I'm not touching it. Desmond Howard was the first star that, uh, you know, and there were all, all kinds of wonderful people I had worked with, but Desmond Howard is the first kid who walks up to me and says, um, I want to work with you. I said, why is that, sir? He says, I've been studying you for a year and a half. Well, you're, 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 you just turned 19. Yes, I've been watching you for a year and a half, and I'm fascinated by your personality and style. And, you know, I have a question. I said, what's that? He says, when you talk, I see three different personalities. I said, go on. He says, you seem like a scholar who's studied and done the research and you, you, you know, some of your stuff is data driven. And then you turn into a passionate, perhaps um, uh, pastor like, and then you turn into, at that time, Richard Pryor. <laughs> and I'm saying, what are you saying? He says, I want to know, is it on purpose? I said, how old are you? He says, I'm 19 years old. I say, son, you're telling me you have reviewed and studied my techniques. And yes, when you're talking to the crowd, you turn into three different personalities. Why is that? Oh, my God. I said, well, there's at least six audience members, <laughs> six learning styles in the room. I'm going to tap into three. There's one person in the room that if I'm not uh, grounded in, by theory and, and, and the formulations of mm, what's really the research driven boom, 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 they're not interested. There's another person, if I don't have passion, mm -hmm. if I don't have fire in my bones, they're not going to hear me. And there's another person that I got to con and manipulate and make them laugh and then slip right. the truth in on them. He says, Oh my God, I want to do that. Wow. And he became my mentee. Wow. We haven't been able to get rid of him since. <laughs> you guys are, it's unbelievable. And that just the way you told that story, I felt this groundbreaking amount of humility from him. I feel like there's a lot of people with talent, but there's this thing called humility that I just don't see very often. And you have it. So you're a match for people who have it. And it, it just seemed to be like a thread in all the ways you describe the people that you worked with, that there was some ability to be self-reflective. And I'm just amazed by that. You, um, you put together so much goodness in this book. It should be required reading. Everybody should have to read this book. Every Look, kid uh, in high school, you, every parent, every spouse, every pastor, every rabbi, everyone should read this book. This book, let's just start with when somebody finishes reading this book, what were you hoping they walk away with? That they would walk away with a commitment to become the world's greatest expert on one subject themselves. That's all I want. The whole mission of the book is to teach people that the best friend they should have in life should be in the mirror. <laughs> that self-love and self-acceptance will overrule all kinds of nonsense that's happened in your life. 
Letting go of yesterday's baggage is an art form that you have to practice, train, and rehearse until you get good at it. And so if people can walk away and know that, you know how many people you have in your life who, who try to tell you what to do, what to think, and how to act, and they're real experts on you? You notice that the only changes you made though was, was when you decided. Yeah. <laughs> so I can be really good, Kathy. I can be good at what I do. It doesn't matter how good I am. If you don't decide, you understand. He, oh my God, if anyone can get this, it's you. You ready? There, human beings are the only creatures who have been given the ability to decide, I am not going to be the same today as I was yesterday. <laughs> Think about that. What other creature can decide to change, to be deliberate and intentional? about taking control over their own life, over their own mind, over their own faults, over their own passions, over their own fears. Human beings are the, a dog gonna be a dog every day. <laughs> Your cat, <laughs> chilling. <laughs> I'm gonna be a cat. That's what I do. That's right. <laughs> but we have the ability to decide I'm not gonna be a victim anymore. I'm not going to be a slave to my own fears and anxiety and okay. self-doubt. Fear and self-doubt is the greatest enemy you will ever face in this life. Yeah. But if you're no longer afraid of being afraid, that's a game changer. That's so big what you just said. It reminds me, I had a conversation uh, with Howard Schultz a few years ago and uh, I said to him that there, I, I learned in Jerusalem for a few years, I was studying there. And I said that there's a story in the, in the Talmud that when God is about to create the world, the angels say, don't do it because everything is perfect. And God says, just you watch what they can do with their free choice. <clears throat> and in that way, they can be higher more elevated than an angel because an angel doesn't have free will. It just works for God. It knows what to do all the time. But we have choice and you're right. We get so caught in the unconscious program that we forget that our crowning jewel Come on. is that we can choose out of this unconscious trap. The question is, the unconscious mind, it's so pervasive that it makes you feel that that is reality. How do you help people to overcome that constant low self-worth, that old tape, that old soundtrack that just plays so that they can choose to feel beyond that? Well, you've got to get people give them an opportunity to consider some things. <laughs> See, if we simplify it and not overindulge in cycle babble, it's going to boil down to what's working and what's not working in your life. <laughs> I need you to be at least sensitive enough and, and to understand that critical self-assessment hmm. is the cornerstone that you can build on the ability to critique. I'm not talking about criticism. We're good at criticizing, but sometimes we're not that good at critiquing our own strengths, our own weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. SWOT analysis, MBA, la di da -dee, right? So what is absent? If getting drunk every day is working for you and, and you're maintaining relationships and you're keeping your job, that's, hey, peace be with you. <laughs> if it's not working, perhaps you might want to consider changing. So what we do is we begin to teach people how to really evaluate, to do self-evaluation, and not just begging somebody else to tell you what to do or what to think. Then we try to convince people that, imagine telling uh, um, Tom Brady at 19 years old, 
Tom, the most difficult thing I'm going to tell you is this. You have to decide with or without football. Dramatic pause. <laughs> Your life is going to be amazing. Now, Brady is so bloody smart. And I've done this over and over. And I said, so what am I saying, Tom? And he says, well, technically, it sounds like you're saying, <laughs> he breaks it down, that you're saying that <clears throat> I'm more than an, a football player, that I, that how I feel about me must not be based on football. I said, oh, my God, who is this kid? <laughs> All I said was how my self-worth and self-esteem must not be based on my job, on my money. Oh, 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 how cute I am. I ain't. How I feel about me. Self-love and self-acceptance, caring about me, loving me, flaws and all. I say now, Tom, the next piece is maybe not be, it, it may not be as hard, but it's hard. You've got to decide with or without football, your life is going to be amazing. Win, lose, or draw. So when I tell people, you know, hey, you've got to decide your life's going to be amazing, they think I just said you're going to win, 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 win. That's total nonsense. It means that when you win, you'll be great at it. And when you lose, you'll be great at it. When it doesn't work, you'll recover faster than the average person, which is mental fitness. Recovery time. How fast you recover from a loss, from a disappointment, from a fumble, from throwing an interception. <laughs> you have to be that guy that if it's not working, how I feel about me doesn't change. I hate losing, but losing is not going to destroy how I feel about me. I mean, it's so powerful what you just said. It the there needs to be another word more than powerful because it's profound. It's critical. It's critical that we understand what you just said, that our sense of self worth is not attached to anything. And as long as God's beating your heart and you wake up every day, you just report for duty, but you're so much bigger than all of those things. I think one of the things that I hear from my audience is a lot of self-doubt for sure. And I'd love you to expand on that because it's one thing for people to hear somebody say, be kind, love yourself, you know, all of that stuff. But in, in practice, I think it's hard if and when you received a feeling that love from your parents was a transaction, mm -hmm. right? You'd be loved if you got a good grade. You'd be loved if you were thinner. You'd be loved if you fill in the blank. So there's a way in which we then hold ourselves to a standard where we would be lying if we said, sure, Greg, no problem, I'll love myself because there's a fundamental contrast. So how do you help people to reframe that? By asking them to be deliberate and intentional, <laughs> to not hope for it, not to just pray for it, but actualize it by mm. being deliberate, taking steps. And if you can't do it by making decisions, get professional help, yeah. get a coach get a heller, <laughs> get a counselor, get a consultant. I try to convince people that counselors are like consultants. You know, if you're running uh, Google, you, know, you yeah. may make, make a few hundred million dollars a year. I don't know. Do you use consultants? Yes. Yeah. So if I'm getting paid 10 million, hundred million dollars a year, why do I need a consultant? because I, there are blind spots that I cannot see. So I reach out for help. I beg for help. I utilize resources. I'm no longer ashamed or afraid or think something's wrong with me for needing help. But I don't need counseling. I don't need a psychiatrist. I'm nothing wrong. I'm not crazy. Do you need a consultant? Well, uh, yeah. mm. So if you begin to understand that counselors are like consultants, you can hire them. And if it fits, you'll keep them. If it doesn't fit, you'll fire them and get another one. Wow, you that is be that confident about counseling. Counseling is for you. 
Yeah. <laughs> and you must utilize and take advantage of someone who's trained yeah. to help you see things you cannot see. That's one way to look at it. That's the, other, the most compelling case I've ever heard for that. That makes complete sense. It does, because there's blind spots. And why would you not want to assess that to get the edge on living your potential? That makes so no that, sense. What did you just say, to get to what? The edge. Because if we convince people we're going to stack the deck in their favor, mm -hmm. they'll say, hmm, let me consider this. Yeah. If I can convince somebody that if you pursue self-mastery, yeah. you'll be a better athlete. You'll be a, be a better CEO. You'll be running your law firm better than anyone else could. You will yeah. believe in your people better because you believe in yourself. It will transfer to how you treat other people. Yeah. If all you're doing is being rigid and hard on yourself, uh, you'll love this. I was invited years ago to an all women's conference. It's the keynote speaker. Get out. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, like I, and you know, I wasn't doing a lot of public speaking, but I'm like giddy. I'm beside myself because this is one. Of the, I had always been a a a, 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 a workshop seminar leader at the at the event, and they said we want you to do the keynote. I said you don't tease me. Say no, seriously. All right, now, hell, I swear to God, I di I didn't write long speeches i would take a business card and make five points that i'm going to make and i do my speech now i'm like i gotta write a speech <laughs> I, I gotta be organized i gotta be disciplined so i come up with this title that you will get one is a whole number and it dawned on me that only 10 percent of the audience <laughs> We get it. I said, oh my God, but I love this title. One is a whole number. I mean, it implies that all you need is at least you. And I say, but it's not about me and how my mind works. It's not about the engineers in the room. <laughs> and I said, here's the title. So I introduced, I was introduced and I said, I came up with uh, two titles. First one is one is a whole number. And 10, 20% said, ooh. And other people are like, okay. I say, but I, I figured I needed to come up with something better than that. Say the title of my speech today is, you want me to love you, but you don't even like yourself. The crowd went crazy. <laughs> and that's all we're trying to get people to understand that we're always looking for approval and acceptance from everybody else. That's it. There are four A's that and whenever somebody says all and every, they're going to say something profound or something completely stupid. Yeah. Every one of us needs the four A's. The need for attention, affection, approval, and acceptance. I've made a complete fool of myself. Pick one. <laughs> okay, pick two. Okay, all four. <laughs> But I've also risen to an unbelievable heights in pursuit of the four A's. So when we're talking about developing people to become the best version of themselves, we teach them how important it is to put the word self in front of each one of those A's. Mm -hmm. You've got friends that you know people who are the best friend you could ever have in your life the way that they attend to your needs, how affectionate and caring, and they leave a care, compassion, and concern, and they always giving you approval, and you just know that they, they just love you, unconditional. But you notice they're not as patient or kind or generous with themselves. Right. All we're asking them to do is begin to be as attentive to themselves as they are to everybody else wow. to be more affectionate more loving deliberately loving self more than everyone else can and then to not settle for approval when they want acceptance we all need approval but acceptance so you already indicated approval is conditional how high can he jump <laughs> you know <laughs> did you get good grades <laughs> 
uh, 40 hours, you did good, here's your paycheck. I approve of your behavior. The acceptance is totally different. So if we just, just separate two of them, self-love and self-acceptance. If I can love myself, flaws and all, I just changed the game. You just helped me understand something, which is, you know, earlier you were saying this beautiful journey of surrender. And you said, and I had to surrender this ego. And I think one thing that I've struggled with is that the more I've sat in meditation or in the pursuit of a higher consciousness, I look at this Kathy Heller avatar sometimes, this ego, and I go, oh man, we got to rewrite the code on that one. And so then I feel justified in not loving her. Mm. But when you just spoke that, in the way you spoke it, in the speed you spoke it, what I heard is, but we love other people's egos. We love them. Laws and all. Laws and all. <laughs> so then if we're being intellectually honest, mm. yes, you might believe that everyone you love has a soul for sure. And yet, when you're being that kind and compassionate and caring, you're showing up to love their soul and their ego. But why don't you do that for yourself? So imagine this. If I'm, I've been a clinical therapist for years, and you know that in clinical therapy, we're not introducing uh, God concepts, et cetera. But if somebody walks in talking about, <clears throat> I love Jesus. Oh, You're like, let's go. <laughs> You know, you know, my God is alive. That's nice. You know, I read the Torah every day. Oh, so is this a subject area we can walk into? Oh, yes, let's go. Awesome. So like now I'm dealing with somebody who's depressed and preoccupied with self-loathing. So I ask him, are they smarter than God? I think so God's stupid for loving you, huh? <laughs> so you know better than your coach. You know better than everybody that loves you. We just stupid. Well, I mean, I'm not saying that. Yes, you are. <laughs> but I no, that's what you're saying. That we recruited you and, and the person who recruited you is an idiot. I'm not saying that. Uh, well, God loves you, and you're smarter than God. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> hey, so you have to get people to go to the next level of thinking. They can't stop it. I'm so stupid. Well, okay, that was what I did was stupid, but I'm not stupid. And not only that, I need to stop saying that because it reinforced. And so you get them to stop at stop limiting themselves yeah. by that first thought of, that comes from anxiety and, 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 and fear. Fear and self-doubt are the greatest enemies you will ever face on this earth. And when people tell you, be fearless, don't be afraid, I challenge them. How long have I known you, Kathy Heller? 36 minutes. All right. I guarantee you, I'm getting ready to say something that will make sense. Some of the greatest moments of your life, some of the grandest adventures you've ever been on, some of the amazing things that have happened to you. You're about to crap your pants before that. A hundred percent, yeah. Some of the greatest moments of your life. Yeah. Childbirth. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> think about the people you know and love you can anyone that you see you know that some of the most fun they've ever had they were terrified yeah so we teach what i teach instead of telling people you shouldn't be afraid it's nothing to be afraid of i tell them to stop being afraid of being afraid wow because fear is oh, no it's part of life it's one of the part of what makes it a grand adventure. Courage is not the absence of fear, Kathy. 
It's facing fear. The word courage doesn't even exist unless we're talking about overcoming fear. Am I right or wrong? Totally right. <laughs> well, you talk about so many beautiful things in this book. One of the things that strikes me the most in speaking with people you address and how to be different on purpose is one of the things you talk about in this book. And I want to bring it up because what I find is fascinating is more than childbirth, more than a lot of things that people could have evidence that they're scared of. People want to belong so bad. Mm -hmm. They're so afraid to stand out. They're so afraid to be different. And then you come along and say how to be different on purpose. And I would love for you to speak to that because I do feel like one of the biggest tragedies I see is that no one even belongs to themselves anymore because we want to belong to each other by being who we think the other person wants us to be. So we don't belong to anyone. So you don't know what everybody is thinking or feeling because everyone just wants to be accepted. You want to be liked on social media. You want to be liked for who you voted for. You want, you want to feel that somehow you're not different. And yet God made us each unique. We each have a different fingerprint. We each have something different. So how do we rewire that one? Because that to me seems like the biggest tragedy if people are not their uniqueness. Well, here's, here's the, uh, one of the blessings of Judeo-Christian orientation is humility and not wanting to be a narcissist. So our individual excellence, I mean, this is the strangest country. Individualism is dominant <laughs> in the community, eh, you know. Right. But we need community and we need to belong. So uh, it, how, it's so confusing. But being different is more fun than bubblegum. <laughs> being an outlier, you don't want to be like everybody else. But you, you don't want to be this fruit of the loom. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're not talking. See, when I, when I was growing up and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I, I was always an oddball. And what, at one period of life, I'd say, I want to be eccentric. Say, like, what? I say, no, that's what I want to be when I grow up, an eccentric. What are you talking about? I say, well, I'm a little crazy, but I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> to, be, to be an eccentric means that I'm a little crazy and can afford it. <laughs> that's true. getting locked up <laughs> oh that's mr harden you know he's a little <laughs> he's a little different but what we discover is that following the crowd my father would say boy if you see the crowd going in this direction go behind them get up on a hill see where they're going before you join if you're not leading them over them oh if they all going over a cliff you better be the one leading <laughs> so being different has to be embraced as something special, not as being weird. And if you're weird, and if you don't love being weird, it's not going to work. Because people are weird and they hate themselves. No. Being different has to be something we embrace and teach people how to do it in such a way that it builds them. And it builds everyone around them putting people down and, and, and picking on people and, and being uh, um, sarcastic, wit, all that stuff, you know, is what you learn from your peer group. Building people up, helping people believe in themselves, that's not the norm. Kathy Heller, you know, for some odd reason, God touched you in such a way that you're, <laughs> you turned your passion into what? get out how many <laughs> but you aren't you aren't caught up in the fantasy is i have four hundred thousand friends no <laughs> you have four hundred thousand followers you have four hundred thousand likes it's radically different from fantasizing that they're your friends and being different means that you allow yourself to go out on, you know, why would you want to do a podcast? I mean, you know, there's no money in that. I mean, people, are, there are people who loved you were telling you don't do what you're doing right now. And you dared to be a little different. You dared to do podcasting a little differently. Yeah. 
you dare to have a, to understand that you could talk about there are three levels of fitness, physical, mental, and spiritual. If you cheat in one, this is definitely for your audience. If you cheat in one, the other two will not be fully developed. Periodically, you have to isolate one and build on it. So you have the audacity to include in your podcast an element of spiritual fitness. <laughs> believe it. And you're not telling them what to believe, but you're telling them they better believe in something That's right. other than their own fears, their own That's ego, right. their own fantasy. Wow. I'm curious in the behind the scenes that you've been there at the 11th hour with some of the most talented people you've seen when they feel like the whole world is against them. You've seen those moments. You've seen when they kind of hit the wall. How do you feel that their spiritual life or what is bigger than this, just their physical ability has gotten them through? Like, what have you, what have you seen that we might not see? Well, I have seen people begin to understand that the thing that got them to finish a race when they were behind is it begins to help them open the door to understand it was your spirit. It was something inside you that gave you that extra gear, something inside you that you tapped into that took you to the next level of performance. And so you understand spirit. And when they say the word spiritual, you get confused because you organize, I don't like organized religion. Yeah, I don't care if you like organized religion. You need to understand that there's something extra in all of us that you can tap into. And I've seen it. You've seen it. You've done it. We've done it. Anyone can do it. And it's not always easy. But to believe in something other than yourself, I, I don't care if you believe in cabbage. <laughs> I need you to believe in something. And here's, this is how I hook people. You ready? You have a spark of life, right? You know you're alive for, for a brief moment in time. How can the spark and not worship the flame. So beautiful. My um, my husband used to work at Fox Sports. He was a VP of uh, legal for years. So we used to get to go to, we didn't actually get to go to the fancy stuff because they'd give the tickets to like ad sales guys, but we got to go to the NBA all-star breakfast every year. And the first time he asked me to go, I said, you know, I don't know these players. I don't know. I'm not a sports fan, really. But boy, did I become a sports fan because we went for 14 years. And the first breakfast I went to, I said, well, maybe there'll be good waffles. And we <laughs> sat down and one by one, Magic Johnson. And at one point, John Wooden and the people that would get up and speak. That was church. Every single thing that came out of any of those people's mouths had nothing to do with how many hours they spent in practice. It was all about being a part of something bigger than themselves. Yes. And that is what we are witness to when we are watching someone who's excellent at anything. And I came to understand that this has nothing to do with with, with an algorithm about somebody's performance physically, because even Tom Brady, my husband and I went to this speech with Wayne Gretzky and he, and he showed that Tom wasn't the first pick in the draft. He wasn't the second pick. He wasn't the third pick that, that this kid built himself despite. So I don't know if you want to touch on that, but I think it's, I think that this is something that we don't see because we look on social media, we see the highlight reels of things. We don't see the before, we don't understand what's going on. So we just assume that everybody else has something we don't and therefore why even try? Because we don't understand what goes into building ourselves into our potential. Tom Brady allowed me to convince him that 
to not care about what everybody else thought. The coaches don't like me, Tom. I don't care what your coaches think. All I care about is what you think. Wow, that's so hard. Tom, I don't care that they don't see you. Do you see you? I don't care that they're only giving you three reps. Those three reps have to be the most amazing reps anyone could possibly see consistently. And they're going to give you five. And those five, brah, four out of five got to be spectacular. Until somebody says, well, we give him 10. And that's what's going to happen to you in your life over and over. All you've got to do is give 100, train yourself to give 100%, 100% of the time at everything you do. Compete at everything, including self-mastery. Learn to master your thoughts. Learn to master and commit to your dreams. Learn to just not just dream big, but to believe big in order to become big. So it's so important that people allow themselves the freedom of believing in themselves. Not that they're going to be a mega star, but that they're going to be a star at everything they do. Being a parent, being a friend being a spouse, being a significant other. I don't care what it is. Okay, so let's be real honest. Wow, that sounds exciting. But can anyone give 100% 100% of the time? No. So what is the lesson here? Default mode. What? My default mode is to try to give 100%, 100% of the time. And before then, if, if I was off, I was off, I was like giving 30%. <laughs> well, I was off on a good day, I might get 60%. But if my default mode, the way I see myself, if my mindset, if my attitude is to give my best every chance I get, my worst day. It's going to be better than the average person's best day. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a game changer. I know I'm not going to be perfect. The pursuit of perfection is fun. To be, so thank you, perfect. That's that's not going to work. I'm not praying to you tonight. <laughs> it's, it's it's so powerful, and it brings me to tears when you talked about those three reps and then those turning into five because you focus on what you believe about yourself. I mean to really condition ourselves to that practice is a life changer. It's a life changer. But even still, I want to go further because there are so many phenomenal human beings in all these industries, sports and music, who you could all say, they're all in that conversation, right? About greatness. But then there are some who even in the conversation about greatness, they're singular and he's singular. Like it's singular. It's not even in the same conversation about greatness anymore, we're talking about, so what do you think if you had to say, what, what is that? What makes somebody that where it's like, it's, we're already clear there's greatness. Like that is for sure. But now within that conversation, you are literally a once in a generation example of a human in certain realms that is singular. Like what, what is that, that a person is tapping into? They're tapping into a, fra- a frame of mind that says, I'm not trying to be a star. I'm trying to be the best at everything I do. They're, they, they are able to say, follow me. They're able to lead. They're able to take anyone around them and try to make them better than they were yesterday. Mm. You understand? So they're not just trying to build themselves up. They're trying to build up the whole crew. They're trying to get the whole crew to believe in themselves. This is a true story. That's it. That's it. Brady went from the Patriots to the Buccaneers. And so, I mean, I know the game a little bit and I know him a little bit. I figure in two years, he's going to turn this into a championship team. Tom gets there and this guy comes up to Tom and Tom is open and accessible to his teammates. He says, 
And the guy was venting and complaining and whining about how he didn't make the to the Pro Bowl this year and how was it wasn't fair and it just sucks and these people don't know what they're and Tom Brady looked at him, he listened to him, he say Pro Bowl. Well, we going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> he said he said when Tom Brady looked at him and said, he said, Her? Because he, he 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 couldn't get his head around going to the Super Bowl. And Tom Brady looked at him and said, no, 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 no. The Pro Bowl ain't your vision, son. Super Bowl is your vision. He said it changed his whole outlook on life. That this guy looked at him wow. and told him he needs to expect more wow. from himself and from this team. So the ability to not just think about yourself. Mm -hmm. The ability to understand that uh, it works if you can create a team. It works if you can uh, uh, support people in their dreams. I, look, my life is working because I made an effort to create opportunities for other people's lives to work. That's right. <laughs> so... I'm writing a book <laughs> and in the book, I'm capturing everything that I've, uh, I've tried to share with people who were regular folks. There are people in this book, Emily Line. Emily Line just was uh, one of the keynote speakers at the Realtors Association's Lottie Dottie Conference uh, alongside the Kansas City Chiefs head coach. <laughs> I think it's Andy Reid. <laughs> And like she said, like, she, 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 who the fuck it? She was my intern mm. <laughs> as a social worker, and she was trained to be a social worker. And she went from from being a social worker to working at a racetrack, to being a salesperson, to being now the vice president of Realtors Association, Lottie Dottie, and she's headed into the stratosphere, and she was the nicest, most humble individual. And she was a blonde and blue, tried and true, stereotype, you know, and, and she shattered all stereotypes. I told her, you got to think like you're a Black person. <laughs> Your job is to shatter all stereotypes about blonde and blue. <laughs> and, I, and you don't care if people judge you. You'll take advantage of them being stupid enough to assume they know who you are and they don't. She said, ooh, I said, you know, I, I, I'm just saying, you can discount me, dismiss me because of the way I look. That's your error. I'm going to take advantage of it. If you think I'm stupid, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm going to jack you <laughs> and take all you got. <laughs> because you've just told me you're not thinking beyond superficial. And we think beyond superficial. A Tom Brady, you don't even have to like football. But you know the Super Bowl, you're having a big party. <laughs> you ain't even watching the game. But all of a sudden you hear it's 28 to 3. Atlanta Falcons, boom, have a 28 to 3 lead at halftime. It's not a division championship it's not a regular game it's the super bowl the two best teams in the country are together and they're getting their butts handed to them by one team only reason i'm watching it at this point is because that's my guy <laughs> and, and like if anybody could pull it off it's him but it, it, it's not it's not probable but it's not impossible Tom Brady, all he wanted was to get back on the field. Anybody else would have been struggling. I don't know. Oh, my God, I threw two interceptions. Oh, my God. You know, they get stuck into going back into the mistakes. They made. He doesn't have time for it. He recovers quickly. And all the while, it's 28 to 3. He's saying, just let me get back on the field. I've got a team I believe in. And we'll do our best. He's going to give 100%, 100% of the time, win, lose, or draw. And if they had lost, you would be saying, 
that was the best game I ever saw in my life. Every word, every single word is such a blessing. Tell everybody where they can buy the book. We'll put links in the show notes and uh, tell them where they can follow you. You can go straight to Amazon and, and, and pre-order now. I, then I'll be like Kathy and I will be trending. <laughs> I had to learn that word, you know. <laughs> right. So pre-order now. Uh, the book comes out in a matter of, of days. It's going to drop on August 15th. Amazon, Apple, Barnes and Noble, they all of them are ready. And we've got to get, we've got to convince them that people other than athletes are interested in what I have to say. Oh my gosh. I think they should turn this into a documentary. You're probably oh, already working on that. Oh, bless your heart. But my my life has been amazing and the blessings continue to flow. And I'm just, I'm just too dumb to be depressed. I mean. You know what? It's because we get what we are. It comes right back. And what you are is love. Thank you so much, Kathy. I, I was thrilled to have an opportunity to hang out with you. And you know, Emma is bad. I just, I don't even know, but I know Emma's bad. She's <laughs> awesome. Where do you live? Where in the world are you? I, we have a place in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we have a place in Denver, North Carolina. There's a Denver, North Carolina. <laughs> so, Those are good uh, places. Those yeah. are good places. Well, I'm going to reach out to you privately in case there's ever something I can do for you in Los look, Angeles, maybe some some gathering or something. Look, you know, I got your back. Thank you for being you. Yes, ma'am.